Today, we have many traditions on All Saints Sunday, and a little later, you'll hear the reading of the Necrology, which is the list of names of, of all the people who we've loved and lost in the past year, some whom we've simply um, buried and said goodbye to this year that died before. And with each of those names is a story and a compelling life lived or a tremendous loss too young or too soon. And the, with each name is a family and a community, and in this case, a church who remembers them, gathers around their memory. And it's a powerful, powerful time to hear that list of names read. As long as it is, it, it locates us in this moving stream. Every year we have a very fulsome list and so much happens in a year. So All Saints Sunday, it's a time to look back, it's a time to look forward, and it's a time to locate ourselves in this story that's ongoing and started long before we got here and continues long after we will be gone. And on All Saints Sunday, you know, we tend to think of saints as those people who have been officially canonized, you know, long ago by a big church and their names are set in stones on churches and churches are named after them. Sometimes they're made into statues and, um, you know, those are the, they're, they're so removed from people that we, we know and can see or that we are in our minds. And it's, it's unsettling um, because I also remember Dorothy Day and in 2012, she was canonized by the Roman Catholic Church. And if anyone deserved to be a saint, it's Dorothy Day. She gave decades of direct service to the poor. She critiqued the systems that kept people in poverty. She invited and encouraged thousands of people to get involved in this direct service to the poor. She was known for her personal piety, for her generosity, for her compassion and for her dedication to a simple life and outspokenness. And she received an enthusiastic endorsement from the U.S. Uh, Academy, or Conference of Catholic Bishops, and nobody objected. Even though she, she didn't pay taxes in protest, she was against the American capitalist system. I mean, no one spoke out against her canonization. And she deserved to be a saint. There is just unequivocal uh, ways to back that up from the church's point of view. But there was a problem. She famously said during her life, don't call me a saint. I don't wish to be dismissed that easily. She felt that, you know, the, the person who made that statement famous was Robert Ellsberg, the, the publisher at Orber, Orbis <coughs> Books, who was the editor of her letters and her um, and her journals, and he had worked with Dorothy Day. He was the editor of the Catholic Worker newspaper, and he worked alongside her in the soup kitchen, and she helped with, he helped her um, with this corporal service to the poor, with food and clothing and shelter. And he sat at, at kitchen tables with her, and, and he, he, she said this to him, and he wrote it down and made it famous. And she had expounded to him that what she meant was, when people call you a saint, they put you on a pedestal, and they name a church after you, and then they're done with you, and they, they dismiss you. So she did not want to be dismissed that easily, and that's what she meant by the saying. And the bottom line for her was that we are all called to be saints. And she also said that um, we might as well get used to recognizing the fact that there is some of the saint in all of us, as much as we are putting off the old man and putting on Christ, there's some of the saint, the holy, the divine within us already. So we are all called to be saints. And uh, when, when, we're, when we're here on All Saints, we traditionally baptize, which we will do today. And it's so great to see all of you, five candidates for holy baptism. Porter Sig uh, had grown up embracing this of his own accord as a grown up and your family surrounding you. We have four babies whose parents and grandparents and godparents are committing themselves to this way on behalf of their children and will commit to raising themselves on this path. And in turn, we will all take our place to renew our baptismal covenant. And this week I've met with, uh, either online or in person, with all of the, the families and with Porter, and 
we've reviewed the words of the baptismal covenant, and I just wanted to draw all of our attention, since we are all recommitting ourselves to Christ, those of us who are baptized, and the words are right there in our service leaflet, the words of this, this liturgy, and on page four, you will see that there's powerful language here. And um, to be called a saint or to strive towards sainthood or to just live this path, it all comes down to an orientation, the direction we face in our life. And I just wanted to point out that when we say our covenant, we will say three renunciations and three affirmations. And these sentences go way back in our tradition way back to the, at least the second, maybe third or second century. And when catechumenates were preparing for baptism then, it was a life-altering, sometimes life and death prospect. And they took it very seriously. They would take three years to prepare for their baptism. And finally on Easter Sunday of the third year, they would come and be allowed to have Holy Communion after their baptism. But they were examined and their sponsors were asked, you know, is this person worthy of baptism? Have they performed works for the poor, or cared for the widow and the orphan? Uh, and then the candidates would, you know, put their bodies facing west and they would renounce all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God. West representing the darkness and sunset and separation from God. And they would renounce the evil powers of this world, which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God. They would renounce the sinful desires that draw us from the love of God. And then on the fourth question, they would turn their bodies all the way west, east, and face the light of God and the sunrise and the place where God is and the light of Christ that dispels the darkness, all symbolized in the facing east. In this church, West and East are, not, are here, this way and that way, but in many churches, the, the altar is on the East end for that reason. And we turn, and that is the symbol of our intention in baptism, and all of us turn our direction to face the light of, of God and where the life-giving power of God is. And later, when we get to our baptismal promises, we will continue with, in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in the prayers, and then in the second question, will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? And the operative word here is whenever. It doesn't say if ever. Of course we'll fall off the path. Of course we don't stay in the same direction all our lives. And the promise is just turn around. We turn again and again. We turn and return. And that is the practice of the Christian life, is, is turning and returning turning and returning. It's sometimes moment by moment, not just season by season or day by day, but sometimes it's moment by moment that we commit to that. So embedded right in our language is this orientation. And sometimes I feel that's all we need to know. You know, if you forget everything else, just turn ourselves towards the light and towards the life-giving place of God and the power of God. Um, two of my favorite theologians were William Willimon and Stanley Hauerwas. And together they wrote a book called Resident Aliens, a, provo a provocative Christian assessment of culture and ministry for people who know something is wrong. And in this book, they say, when we are baptized, we, like the first disciples, jump on a moving train. As disciples, we do not so much accept a creed or come to know the sense, or come to know a clear understanding of ourselves by which we know this or that with utter certitude. We become part of a journey that began long before we got here and shall continue long after we, were gone, we are gone. And we're, we are moving on a train, and when you get on a train, trains go in one direction. You can't hop on and off while it's moving. We commit, you buy your ticket, and you go in that direction. And in a way, that's what we're signing on for. We're signing on to a path and to a journey that goes in the direction of God and tries to go along in the direction of God and stay on the train. And of course, it's not easy. And when Jesus is teaching his disciples these blessings and woes, you know, it's part of this much bigger sermon on the plain. He's preaching to people on earth with their feet on the ground and having to live the daily life. Um, he's, he's saying, he's giving us an orientation of our inner hearts. And it doesn't matter how much money you have or don't have. If our, if our gaze is turned in the right direction, 
we can laugh, we can be joyful, we can, we can um, rejoice and leap for joy even while we're being pushed aside by the culture and the prevailing culture. It's very difficult to stay in one direction when everything around us wants us to go in another direction. And the commitment to turn our gaze toward God and toward the light of Christ, um, that's the way that we all have the saints of God with, within us. We all have the holy, the divine. Everything it takes, we have a place to turn. And uh, it's not really so much about our performance, it's about our freedom, and it's about our ability to sit back on the train and let it take us where God wants us to go. So the, the joy of this day is to welcome all of these um, soon to be newly baptized onto the train and to travel with us as we go together. And uh, the joy of this day is that uh, wherever we are, wherever we go, wherever life throws at us, we have a place to turn. Amen. Thank you.